Oops. <laughs> okay, so hello and welcome everyone to our open town hall. And thank you for joining us tonight to discuss the changes being proposed for the 2022 and 2024 UNASA Constitution. My name is Kelly Tran. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm the president of UNASA. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Nguyen. I go by he, him pronouns. I'm the internal vice president for UNAFSA. And tonight we are also joined by one of our board of director members, uh, Hui Tran. Good evening, everybody. My name is Hui Tran. I'm a member of the board of directors. I was also internal vice president in 2006 to 2008 uh, before y'all ever actually had any kind of hybrid or virtual conferences. All right. Thank you, Hui. So for for this uh, town hall tonight, um, how we'll do this is first we're going to go through all of the list of changes that were made. So as you should be able to see on this screen, this is the document that was sent to y'all. It covers all of the changes we made between the 2020 constitution and the proposed 2022 constitution. Uh, then we are going to, if y'all have any questions in the, uh, if y'all have any questions from the audience that are joining us here today throughout the tonight, please feel free to ask it in the chat and then we'll bring it up later towards the end afterwards. And then after all the questions here have been asked, we're gonna go through any questions from the Google form for those that weren't able to make it tonight. And then that should be it for the session. Um, I'm getting a message, Kay, uh, Kelly, is everyone about people not being able to hop in? Has everyone been able to be out? Uh, yeah, don't worry, I'll, I'll deal with it. Okay, sounds good. All right, so everyone ready to begin. In the email we sent out to y'all, there are four documents for y'all to reference. The first one is the 2020 constitution. Um, that is unchanged in a PDF. Um, that's what we have been operating on for the past uh, two years. You also got this document, which is just a document with all of the changes made to the constitution, as well as the rationale behind those why those decisions were made. Uh, and then you also got this document, which is the final draft of the 2022-2024 constitution, as well as a new document we're adding, which is the constitution. And we'll go over this later down the line. All right, let's get started. Uh, cover pages and preamble, that has not been changed. Uh, no changes yeah. there. What's up? Yeah, I'm sorry, do you mind if I just kind of jump in real quick? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, there's I probably should have expanded a little bit on my role here uh, and also to provide a little context for what you're all about to go over. Uh, so uh, the board of directors was just created in 2020 with the idea that alumni who have been involved for a long time can help provide some context and historical perspective on UNAFSA's growth development and on uh, the structure that it has and on issues that may arise. Um, our responsibility as board of directors is really more about financial oversight uh, and guidance to, to you all. Uh, board of directors is not here to make any decisions on behalf of UNAFSA. We, for all of us, we actually don't want to do that. We try to do as best we can to take a step back and just share some ideas or, or be a sounding board for ideas. Um, in my particular role, uh, in my day job, I'm actually an attorney with a focus on civil litigation. However, I've also worked with a lot of nonprofits to incorporate organizations and help them with structural uh, uh, changes and work through uh, corporate matters as well. Um, the important thing to understand as you're looking through the constitution is the constitution is the governing document that defines the protocols and processes, the fundamental protocols and processes for the organization. But a constitution is also designed to be very hard to change. And the reason why you do that is because the constitution itself is supposed to be to provide stability. It defines uh, the organization structures, the roles and responsibilities of particular bodies within the organization. And it does this on a very foundational level. Um, the goal of the things that you put into your constitution is that they should be, um, that those are the things you want to keep in your constitution because it should stay a part of UNAFSA for a long time. What we don't want the constitution to become is kind of like a playbook that defines every little thing that UNAFSA does or should do. Because let's say, for example, you want to change an aspect of the conference. What you don't want to do is say conference logistics has to happen in this exact way. Conference programming has to look exactly like this. You don't want to say something like that in the constitution, because remember, if it's in the constitution, you have to do it. Right. The Constitution, again, is just there to help define some decision making protocols, the roles and responsibilities in the organization. For anything else, 
you want to create separate documents or separate programming uh, files that allows you to work around a template or a playbook, but doesn't lock you into something where you are unable to change or adapt to the circumstances that you may face any particular year or any particular moment. Okay. So as we're going through and you're going and you're seeing some of these changes, that is one big idea to keep in mind. The constitution is there to lock in those processes that should be there all the time. And it's there to lock in the things that everybody that the people that the people involved with UNAFSA follow all the time. Uh, because it is important to UNAFSA's identity, to its values, and to its foundation. Anything else can be defined outside of the Constitution uh, to reflect what your goals are and how you want to operate for the time that you are serving with UNAFSA. And that was it. Um, all right. Thank you here for that clarification. I hope that has... <clears throat> clarified a lot of things for people here today. Um, is everyone ready for us to go into all of the changes we made? I'm going to take a yes. All right, so from the 2020 to 2022, uh, we, there's no changes to the cover page nor the preamble. Um, that has been always the same. Uh, Article 1, name and identity. Uh, we removed the section where it says the organization will have a seal, which shall be in the following form. And there was a graphic associated with that. Uh, it was like a UNASA banner type of situation. Uh, the statement was removed because UNASA doesn't have a physical seal. We operate entirely online. Um, and keeping the logo outside of the constitution itself allows us to make any changes to the logo as needed um, without locking us in for future years to come. That should be it for Article 1. Article two, uh, mission statement, vision statement, values, and pillars of the uh, pillars of operation. Uh, in the mission statement, we added civic engagement within the past four years or so. Um, this has been a great push from uh, UNAFSA, as, as evident by the 2020 project and our new newish cabinet committee for civic engagement. So this is we added that into the mission statement in values and community and val in values under the community, we added inclusive and safe space, also conducive to the goals of our constituents. Under operating pillars, uh, we removed the imagery and the operating pillars is the one where it says education and then it says leadership, philanthropy and Vietnamese culture. That image was removed from the constitution itself, but it is still made available um, over all of our presentation is still all available on our drive. We just took it out of the constitution specifically. Uh, operation operating pillars, supporting pillar number two, uh, we changed Vietnamese culture to cultivating culture. Um, cultivating, the language around cultivating encompasses much more than just Vietnamese culture itself. And because of how diverse our constituents are in our community is, um, we believe that we should celebrate all cultures and not just specifically Vietnamese culture as an organization. Um, so that's why that language has changed. And then under the same section, we changed the language from language and culture to, it says Vietnamese language and culture, we changed it to Vietnamese heritage. Because same thing, less words. Article three, all the offices. Um, we moved, this is just a positioning, um, we moved minimum qualification above where term limits is. So the section where it says preferred qualifications, we moved that over to the appendix and we only kept the minimum qualifications within the constitution. So if, um, as we explained, this is the things that we have to do. And so the thing, the bare minimum requirement for a BOD member uh, is in the constitution because that is the that is what we at least want. And then the preferred qualification things we're looking for is in the appendix because that can change from term to term. Section two, uh, yeah, selection procedures, uh, that was a procedural, this section was procedural in nature, so that was moved to the appendix. Uh, core uh, responsibilities, only the responsibility section, the list of things that were needed to do, that was also moved to the appendix, but the area that def the section that defined the core itself is still in the main body of the constitution. And then the map of the regions that was moved to the, uh, the appendix as well. 
uh, four core responsibilities. Uh, these were the changes that were made. Uh, develop regionalized resources. We changed it, I changed it to just develop resource in general. It's generalizing the term, uh, the responsibility so that CORE is not limited to just doing things for their region. They can create resources for all of UNAFSAs as well. Uh, mandatory attendance to weekly by weekly CORE meetings, uh, change it to mandatory attendance um, to CORE meetings, um, simply because the IVP and the CORE cohort for that term can decide on when their meetings will be. Uh, lead regional caucus. We took out the section where it says at the annual conference, um, because in prior years or it may be in future years. For UNAFSA 17 specifically, we didn't have regional caucus. Um, so that language was changed so it's generalized. And if we bring back regional caucus or have it um, separate outside of UNAFSA conference, that is also a possibility. Attend and vote on behalf of their region during conference city selection session at the annual conference that was changed to attend and vote on behalf of their region during the conference city selection session. And that is removed. That was changed so that doesn't have to be at the annual conference. It can be done internally or externally from conference itself. That's all the changes to course responsibilities. Section four, voting body, this is the big one. So the entire section has been changed to now say this, the voting body shall have ultimate decision-making authority for all constitutional decisions of the organization. The voting body is made up the executive board, the board of directors, the council of regional representatives, and the cabinet staff. The specific entities within the voting body that are required to vote on constitutional decisions will be depending on which voting measures fall under the purview of each voting entity. And so here, it, the next part says, for the executive board, all members of the executive board will be represented by a singular vote. For the board of directors, all members of the board of directors will be represented by a singular vote. For the cabinet staff, all members of the cabinet staff will be represented by a singular vote. For the regional partners, each region shall have one vote regardless of the number of regional representatives for that region. In the case where two persons serve a joint position, only one person is required to submit the vote on behalf of that entity. The voting body shall vote only on constitutional changes and the and elections that fall under the voting body's jurisdiction. These will be defined as, and here we're defining a constitutional change, changes to the constitution through the amendment process, and that's defined in Article 6, UNAFSA executive board elections, any other voting elect or elections if asked by UNAFSA cabinet staff. So um, the example here would be CPP selection. We usually use the voting body for that. The executive board and board of directors will still have authority over administrative decisions. Later down the line, we'll cover what administ administrative decisions are. Um, but to clarify this whole thing, because this is huge, um, when doing, we'll use elections as an example. Um, so during elections, we originally how the link was written was that each e-board member would have a vote in a decision, and then each cabinet director would have a vote, and then each core would have a vote. So the way this is now written is that all of eBoard collectively will have one singular vote. BOD, if they should they choose to vote, will have one single vote and there's three BOD members. All of cabinet staff, so not one per director, but the collective of cabinet staff shall have be considered one vote. And then each core or each region uh, through their course will have one vote. So the total number number of votes for the voting body will be 16, uh, 13 regions, and then three for a CAB, E-Board, and BLD. And so that shifted a lot of the voting powers back to the constituents. And this change was made because Kelly and I view, feel and believe that for constitutional changes, our constituents should be the one making the vote. And that's why this shift so th this shift was made so that CORE will always have the majority of the vote. And this prevents future e-boards, should they choose um, from the previous language, that if, oh, we're going to make a bunch of cabinets um, for different things, and then they shift, now cabinet may have, we may have like 20 cabinet committees in the future, and each one of those directors would get a vote collectively, and that strips away the power from core and thus our constituency. And so that's why we made a language where we collectively added eboard as one, as well as cabinet staff collectively as one. So the voting power still remains with our constituents through our cores. Did I miss any? No, that's, that's everything there. All right, we'll move down to uh, section five, cabinet and committees. Uh, section five, we was added it, this just defined what cabinet staff is. Um, so 
going through this really quickly. The purpose of cabinet staff is to organize and develop programs compared to the organization's overall missions. So cabinet staff are staff members that carry out UNASA daily operations. So think NPR, CPP, alumni. Cabinet staff are members of UNASA staff that are separate from eBoard, BOD, conference staff, core and president's council and regional partner members. We'll define that later. Um, though cabinet staff can hold multiple positions, um, that overlap with these offices. So for example, core can also be on cabinet staff and conference staff. Each year, EBOR will appoint cabinet staff members and organize them as necessary and carry out UNAPSA's initiatives and programs. Positions are only official and permanent upon approval of BOD or your committee director. Sorry, I'm reading the chat. Positions are only official and permanent upon approval. We all get to you at the after the finishing the section approval of by the e board and or the selection of the directors chairs terms of cabinets are one year and then the responsibilities as follows sorry we brought up that i was going through this too fast has there been any questions about what we covered so far normally i would just ask this at the end Um, I guess for context and just mm -hmm. for helpful for everyone, could you just, um, if there's anything that's like new that's not from the old constitution, could you just like highlight that part so that way we can pay attention to that part? Or like an example, like let's say you change something, just like note that just so that we can like hear it and like see it ourselves. This this entire document is that though. This okay, is perfect. all the changes yeah. that we've made. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, so, so all the changes between there and between 2020 and 2022 is written in this document with rationales as to why that change was made. And that's what we're covering today is the decisions and the thought process behind that. All right, any more questions? Five seconds of silence means no, let's move on. All right, this next section is uh, section five in the 2020 constitution is all of the roles and responsibilities of each committee that we have both conference and cabinet this entire section has been moved to the appendix because they are procedural in nature general staff was removed they have now become a cabinet staff so this section was also removed we added community safety this definition here was provided by our incoming community safety ca cabinet director Anvo. they provided this for us and we felt uh, we looked through this and made sure it was great so this was from them and that's all of section three all the offices section four membership and participation general participation decided we included decided upon by the executive board the previous statement or the previous language prior to this was Requiring member fees for UNAFSA. UNAFSA has never required member fees. Um, we, we, this is all volunteer. To, we, don't, we don't have member fees. So should it ever happen, BOD will also have a voice in that because it's a financial matter. Alumni membership, we removed the part that says paid dues. And then, yeah, we just removed the part that pays due because alumni status is verified through the Alumni Relations Committee. Partner membership, we changed the language from partner membership to regional partner membership. And to explain this, um, when you see regional partner within our constitution, it means UVSAs and IVSAs, that's regional partner. Um, our external partners like CIRAC and Pivot, those are just affiliated partners and external partners. Regional partners specifically means UVSAs and IVSAs. For to define regional partner and a regional partner member uh, is let's say someone who has been involved with a UVSA. So um, just because I'm from South, let's say the South Secretary has been very involved within the VSA space within their region as well as being involved with local schools and UVSAs, but they have never been involved with UNAFSA before. So their status would be considered regional partner member, and that's just a language thing. Section 1C, regions will be defined as below. This has been moved over to the appendix along with anything that has to define regional boundaries and borders. It's all under the regional map. Contribution and standing, this has been moved to the appendix section one. Section 2B, voting. Uh, 
the original language, if you looked in the constitution at this point, has a definition of material decision versus non-material decision. And they defined material versus non-material. And then there was also defining a quorum as well as the percentage in voting. That was very uh, hard to digest for a lot of people. And, and it originally referenced sections that no longer exist or it, we could not find the, where the reference was to. So this, so that's why the, um, in pre, the previous section about the voting body, the language we are now using is a constitutional change versus an administrative change. So this section here now defines administrative changes. Um, so administrative decisions shall be decided by the e-board. An administrative decision is defined by one, not a constitutional decision, but as defined by Article 3, Section 5, which was the voting body, and then impacts the daily operations of UNAFSA. So, an example of this would be budget for alumni relations committee to do alumni relation committee things. We don't need all of cores in BOD and eboard to vote on that budget. eboard will be able to vote on that daily operational. We don't need all of core to vote on budget for ARC. And that's all the changes to that. Any questions so far? Five seconds of silence means no, let's move on. Uh, here's the big one, Article 5, Executive Board Elections. Uh, this first change, we just um, moved it to a different spot in the article. All right, so this one is over elections procedures. We change here. Let's go. The elections for the next, uh, the executive board shall take place either virtual or in person once every two years, currently held on even numbered years, within one month before or after the annual leadership, UNAFSA leadership conference, or within the months of July and August, should the conference not take in place. So, what this, Hui, would you like to explain this one? You had a good explanation when you shared it with us. Sure. Um, some context. Uh, the Constitution was written uh, before uh, virtual experiences were a thing at all. So basically, um, and elections were always tied into conference because, you know, every single year, everybody from across the country came together at conference to vote or to get together to make decisions about CTP beneficiary and to vote on e-board members. Um, because the, uh, you know, because we are transitioning from a, you know, uh, from all decisions get made at conference to something that allows for more remote participation, uh, we're separating out the elections from the conference um, so that we can allow more participation. Um, there's a lot of rules that actually have changed too around who can vote because the original language of the Constitution said that anybody who goes to conference can vote but that then excluded anybody who did not go to conference, right? And the idea was that if we were going to build stronger relationships between UNAVSA and the, the regions, um, we had to expand it where the regions could participate in, in some of the decision-making, particularly around elections. Uh, and even if, they, even if a lot of folks couldn't make it to conference, right? For example, if there's a conference in California, it can be cost prohibitive for people on the East Coast to come and participate. But that shouldn't be a reason for, uh, you know, limiting who gets to participate from the East Coast on choosing who is the uh, um, who is the um, officers. Now, as for the timing of the conference, the reason why we're trying to ensure that the conference the vote the elections happen, you know, within you know a few weeks or within a very close time period to conference is that the conference bump is very real. Right. UNAFSA does operate year round and UNAFSA has programming that occurs year round. However, the time that people uh, are most excited about UNAFSA, the time that people get the most invigorated and inspired to do things with UNAFSA is always centered around conference time. Um, and so if we wait too long for folks to be able to participate in the elections, uh, we just find that participation, um, you know, dips dramatically, right? An example can be, uh, you know, I think in 2020, uh, we actually had special elections because um, uh, in October of 2020, because the elections couldn't be held at conference or there was issues with uh, having elections, at, um, or I guess not enough officers were elected at the conference itself. Um, because that was the case, uh, you know, we had to try again in October, but the problem is that in October, 
it's been a while, people tend to forget about conference or people have a lot of other obligations and it creates a little bit more, uh, it creates more obstacles and challenges to get the voter participation we want to ensure that those who do get elected uh, or take office kind of with uh, with uh, with the knowledge and with um, the, the feeling that they have been elected by the constituency to manage to run and to lead the organization. Thank you here for the explanation. It was so good when I first heard it. All right, section one B. Change, we change candidates are decided by a simple majority vote out of the total regional votes. Candidates are two candidates are elected by a simple majority by the voting body. Um, and we have already covered voting body voting already. Uh, we remove regions must be present and active. That was the that language was around being present and active at conference itself. Um, for those that have been to uh, previous Junafsa's conference prior to COVID. Um, the last one was in 2015 in Atlanta when we had elections. Was it 2015? It was 2015 in Atlanta. Um, the, and especially, actually, for those that went to UNAFSA 17 with CPP, um, being present and active was when if you had to stay in the room and be listen to all of the uh, finalists <clears throat> to be able to vote towards the end. Uh, elections was held in the same manner where you had to be present for all of the candidate speeches and Q&A portion, and then you would have a regional breakout to do the discussion within your regions. Uh, reasons that no longer is uh, within that case, we are going to, that the entire section has been removed. Or that that's why I removed that sentence, sorry. Uh, remove the simple majority to, will determine the region's vote. Uh, this was removed down to because of a later part, which we'll cover down here in section 1C. Uh, we remove prior to the elections, if more than two candidates vying for the same position applies, a primary election is held to determine the two candidates. So what that would, I believe previous years, or you have experienced this with former elections within your local VSAs or UVSAs, if let's say 10 people applied for the external vice president position, let's say, um, then previously elections committee would have a primary voting where they would narrow down the finalists to two candidates. And then uh, those two candidates will be the one presenting at UNASA conference itself. Um, this was changed due primarily, originally from a comment from the elections committee of this past year, This they felt that this was too much power for them to hold. If anyone wants to apply, then they should be able to uh, run and be able to present their platforms during the election to the elections process and to all of the constituents. They felt that by narrowing it down to two, they had too much power in deciding who the next leadership of UNASA was. So that whole section was removed. Each active organization and member present at conference during elections just have a vote. This again is in reference to the language where people had to be present in the room, in that ballroom, when when and where elections was being held to be able to vote. That was removed um, due to the fact that we're no longer requiring that and limiting that to uh, limiting voting power to attendance. Uh, the specific language it's changed to is that each member of the voting body should have a vote previously defined. Each regional partner organization shall, shall determine their own voting methods as determined by the Council of Regional Representatives alongside their executive board to provide a final vote to your NAFSA. This uh, specific language allows everyone, um, all of UNAFSA's constituency and all, thus all of your regional constituency, a ability to vote. Um, so an example, the example I put in here was the 2020 special elections in October of that year, um, when we were filling in the term, the administration for the previous term. Um, so how South did it, just because I'm from South, we had, they had a quiz for us. So after the town hall Q&A session, uh, we had to be there, either be there or watch the recording that was sent out. And then Ebor made or cores made a quiz for all of the constituents. You had a score of one hundred percent, and the quiz was based on of each and every one of the candidates' uh, platforms. So it's a question about why, which position they were in for, why they were, what their goals are, and what they um, just general like. Do do you pay attention questions? And you had a score of one hundred points 
or 100% accuracy on that quiz to be eligible to vote. And then after they voted, then CORE will take the regional majority and presented that one vote to UNAFSA. And so the language around here means allows CORES and eboards to be able to determine who in the re how their region gets the vote. You have the flexibility um, as long as you vote as a region and provide that one vote to UNAFSA, how you determine how your region votes does not matter as long as y'all are democratic about it. All right. Changed. In the event of a tie, the current e board shall cast a deciding vote uh, determined by a simple majority. This change was just to clarify that the simple majority from this language determined by a simple majority. This statement is just changed so that it defines the simple majority will be coming from the current e-board. Uh, remove the suffrage shall be universal, direct, and secret. This has been changed because we changed the way the voting is done. Uh, since we're giving voting power back to the people with cores uh, and e-boards being able to choose their own election or own voting methods, um, this is now obsolete. Qualifications and conditions for candidacy. Uh, we changed some of the requirements. So we changed one of the, the first requirement where it says must have served as a former or current member of UNAFSA cabinet staff and or UNAFSA conference director for at least one year. Uh, this has been expanded to must have served either as one, as a former or current member of UNAFSA cabinet staff and or UNAFSA conference director. Let me put a comma right there. UNAFSA staff for at least one year um, as a director, executive board member, or in a position of similar capacity in a partner organization. This goes back to our example of um, someone being very involved with their region, but not so much UNAFSA, but still has the qualification. This allows them to be able to run for UNAFSA officer, uh, UNAFSA e-board um, for one year. Um, and then, or three, as a director, executive board member, or in a position of similar capacity in an affiliated nonprofit. Uh, the main reason behind why this occurs, um, first off would be with this third, third qualification right here. Um, recently, within the past four years between FOP and Phillips administration, um, we found that it was more beneficial to UNAFSA if the specifically the external vice president role did not necessarily came from the VSA space because of the um, the responsibilities of the EVP role where they are responsible for UNAFSA relations with other with the Vietnamese community as a whole as well as other Vietnamese nonprofits and other nonprofits in general we preferred UNAFSA preferred someone from that nonprofit space to be the liaison between UNAFSA and other nonprofits um, so we had a we wanted to expand on this so that it allowed other people or other can potential candidates who were very involved with the Vietnamese nonprofit space, very involved with the nonprofit space, but not necessarily the VSA space, to be able to run for the EVP role, and that way the other four officers would be able to cover that internally what VSA the VSA background where they had to they had the capabilities to bring in new connections, new networks, and new ideas to the UNAFSA space. The for the first two um, having be able we having to serve as cabinet or conference director for one year. Um, we wanted to expand that because within the past few years, the number of people who have been involved are very limiting. And those that are eligible are either already running um, either e-boards for their own regions or doing other UNAFSA things. Um, so we wanted to expand the amount of candidates we're able to have and allow more people the ability to run for an e position. That was a lot. Thank you for bearing with us. I don't see any questions in the chat, so we're going to move on, and then we'll ask questions at the end of this article. Uh, Section 1C, Elections Committee removed the primary. Um, we've already discussed why they wanted to remove primaries. So if 10 people want to run for e-board, or 10 people want to run for uh, president next elections, all 10 will be on the platforms. All right, the big one, vacant executive board positions. This has been added to appendix section 2D. 
this is a specific language. Should there be any vacant executive board positions after the elections process, the incoming executive board members will appoint candidates to fill the remaining positions. Appointed candidates must meet all qualifications and conditions for candidacy um, that was previously defined. Appointed candidates must be confirmed into office as determined by a simple majority of the voting body. And if elected, candidates will serve out the remainder of the term until the next election. Uh, this is added in for our situation right now. And even with the previous 2020 elections, where we only had an IVP and EVP, and there was no uh, president, treasurer, or secretary. So this only applies after the election process, as well as after, um, should there be resignation, we'll cover that later, but is there, if there is any vacant e-board positions, the language around here states that we are able to appoint candidates into the office, but they still have to one, meet all the requirements of being an e-board member, and then two, the appointed candidates has to be confirmed, essentially voted in by the voting body, which is, all of core cabinet collecting as one vote, eboard as one vote, and BOD as one vote. So even so, there are several checks in place so that we can't just fill in these slots with people we know. Um, they do have to meet all the qualifications, and core still has the voting majority through the voting body to allow the this candidate to be appointed into office. Uh, this is um, I don't want to use Lucy's terminology, but special elections is a very long process. Um, I believe how we've been doing it for the 2020 election, it was the exact same process. All of our special special elections so far is essentially the elections process done again a second time. Um, and with that window, the, the, it's just going to take way too long. So for this past election, the application window for Dinasa Ibor was what six weeks, I believe. And all the applicants came in near or at the after conference itself it's within the last week and then it takes um a week for us to upload all of the information on the website to host the to host the um q a portion and then it takes another week and a half and we did get community feedback that a week and a half was too short for regions to discuss so that timeline would have been extended for another two maybe two and a half weeks for region a regions to be able to meet together and have a discussion and vote collectively. And so that timeline would have looked like anywhere from four to six months to fill in a vacant e-board slot. This shortens that time frame, where it is more efficient for us to appoint a candidate that still meets all the qualification, but allows us to not delay it. Because we only have two years, and six months is already a quarter of our term gone, where we're, we're not able to fill in, we're not able to carry out any of that responsibilities. So this section in the appendix allows us to more efficiently fill in eboard roles as well as, and so that we can just move on and do what we set out to do and what we promised on our platforms to be able to do our due diligence to our constituents. I think that's everything. Resignation and replacement. Uh, we uh, added a line that says replacement candidates are now appointed by the remaining executive board through the procedures of vacant executive board positions, and we just defined vacant executive board positions. So we can still fill them up. They still have to be confirmed by the voting body, which means they still get confirmed by CORE and the rest of UNASA staff. This isn't, oh, this section is in here twice. I will we'll edit this later so that this isn't duplicated. Uh, section two, decisions. This is a section that was the language around material versus non-material decisions, it was referencing sections that no longer exist and the language was too complicated and the math did not check out. Uh, if you see that, if you look on the original 2020 document, that percentage of the quorum did not work out. Article, well, actually, that was, actually I'll finish it now because uh, there's no more, there's not a lot of stuff left. Article six, the amendment process, should we, make any more changes to the constitution, just the constitution, not the appendix, um, they will have to go through the amendment process. There's nothing changed about the amendment process. And then we added the appendix and then specifically the statement that says the appendix is not a constitutional document. It is an operational document that outlines duties and programs. So year to year we'll be able to change the appendix, which mainly contains all of our procedural stuff like roles and responsibilities of committees, regional definitions, uh, stuff like that. 
that can be changed from year to year because maybe we don't have alumni relations one year, we don't have community safety. A good example is um, when we did our interview for Anne, uh, they, and what their vision was for community safety, their vision was that community safety would ideally not need to exist in a couple of years because during their term, they will be able to ingrain um, protocols and procedures and ingrain that culture of community safety into UNAFSA that the Committee for Community Safety no longer needs to exist. So stuff that are transient and not in in, within the long-term goals of uh, UNAFSA itself will be in the appendix. And that is it for all of the list of changes, just to clarify what David brought up earlier. The four documents you had was the 2020 Constitution unchanged in a PDF format. This document that we just went through is a list of all the changes between the 2020 Constitution and the proposed 2022 Constitution and all the rationales behind why that decision was made. So this essentially is the highlighted section. And then you also got the final draft for the 2022-2024 Constitution, as well as the final draft for the appendix of that Constitution. And that's all the changes we made. Uh, I'm going to open up the floor here for anyone that's joining us tonight. If y'all have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat, or you can just raise hand on yourself, do what you need to do. Any questions? Uh, yes, Vivian. Hello. Um, I have a concern regarding how eboard is filling vacant eboard positions. Um, I understand like the concern for like time and efficiency. Like special elections do take a long time, um, and I acknowledge that. But I'm concerned because I feel like having the incoming eboard fill positions for their own board is a conflict of interest. And another thing is I feel like because it's an appointment system, it also takes out the opportunity to apply. Like if someone was interested in filling a vacant position, like now they have to go through you guys and like appeal to you guys if they're interested in that position. And so, yeah, those are my two big things. Okay. Um... Sorry, the first one was. First one was, was, I think it's a conflict of interest to have incoming e-board um, appoint candidates to fill okay. vacant e-board positions. Um, so the to address that, yes, it, it, it could be a conflict of, it is a risk for conflict of interest to appoint people, but ideally we would want to be on a, a cohesive team where everyone on eboard is on the same page and have the same have aligned value, values and missions for the organizations. Um, the checks and balances for that comes in with the voting body and the requirements for us filling in that role because it is checked by first that candidate that we appoint has to meet all the qualifications for eboard in the first place, as well as they have to be confirmed. So they essentially have to be voted in by the voting body and core and the region still have the majority vote when it comes to the voting body because all of core has uh, core each region has one vote, which is 13 votes and the remaining three votes will be collectively all of eboard one collectively all of cabinet staff one and collectively all of BOD one. So out of 13, 16 votes in total 13 of those votes are with core. So that's where the checks and balances for um, conflict of interest comes from. And in terms of uh, the second half of that question was, uh, what was it? What was the second half of the question? It's again? about it was about how, like, with the appointment system, it takes mm -hmm. away the opportunity for people to apply. And mm -hmm. like, if they are interested in a vacant e position, like now they have to, like, appeal to you guys. Yes. And I feel um, like. All right. So. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So. The, the language here is, should there be any vacant eboard positions after the elections process? So the election process still takes place and they still, like everyone still has the opportunity to apply for eboard during the election process. So that's still, we're still having applications open uh, in two conferences from now uh, in 2020, 
2024, when we have that elections year, we still have an application process and anyone can still apply during that year. This vacant e-board position filling only applies after elections has taken place and no one applied for that position. So everyone still has the opportunity to apply for that position. This only takes an effect if no one applied for that position or no one is received into that position. Does, I hope that clarifies your concerns. It, are you still concerned about anything? Um, I don't know. I guess I'm wondering, though, like when it comes to appointing candidates, are you guys just going to do like one candidate per position and then we just have to vote yes or no? Or like, are you guys going to? I don't know, because it feels kind of like even though like like there is a majority within the region or within the regional partners, um, like it puts us at a kind of disadvantage if like we are just like voting yes or no and like you guys get to pick the candidates that we vote on, I think is like more of my concern. I also see who you raised this hand. Did you have a response to that? No, I just want to uh, clear just to clarify something, right? Because it is this is a, a values-driven decision, right? Um, I mean, if you don't like the, uh, the 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 appointment process because it kind of prioritizes efficiency over uh, you know everybody getting to or, or opening up the process where multiple candidates can put themselves out there for the position, uh, right? That is something to take into consideration, right? When you're running elections and when you're talking about electing folks who are, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who are ultimately supposed to manage or, or run the run the day to day operations of the organization, um, typically in a in the business sector, right, there is no such thing as elections, right? In the private sector, you get hired to do the job, you do the job. If it's not good, you get fired, right? In the community model, then we talk about doing, you know, elections, right? Because we're talking about bringing the community together, we're talking about bringing people together. So that uh, you can vote and have uh, um, and and the person, the people who make these decisions, the people who run the organization, are reflective of the constituency. The appointment process is, in a sense, uh, trying to come in between. Right, elections are held once every two years. Um, that should be we want to make sure that uh, we got to do as best we can to make sure that that's common knowledge. Um, but if we have to read the, the concern with doing special elections just to fill in the seed is that, as M said earlier, if it takes us three to six months to really get elections up and running again, um, that takes away from the ability of the folks who are running the organization to act, to be effective, to use their time effectively. Because in effect, right, even right now, uh, only Kelly and M are officers. And so they're serving at a 40% capacity because there are five e-board positions and they have to do that over the next two, three to six months to get things done. Um, so the check and balance here is, you know, yes, they do kind of choose somebody um, and for the voting body, it's up or down, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that there can't be additional procedures that are put in place, for example, an application process that allows folks to apply, right? Um, but at a but in terms of what the constitution lays out as a bare minimum, uh, it does give eBoard the power to appoint uh, a, a fellow officer with confirmation from the voting body um, as a way to create checks and balances, right? So if I can just point out an example, let's say that eBoard decided they're just going to pick people, whoever they want. There's no transparency. There's no open process. They just pick people and then they present it to court uh, or the voting body. If the voting body says, hey, you know what? This has nothing to do with the people you selected, but this process was just really terrible process. We're voting down the person you nominated. That is a perfectly reasonable decision, right? On the other hand, if there if the process itself was open, it was something that the, the, the voting body, um, you know, understands is, uh, um, you know, supportive of and there's an opportunity to get more folks to apply. Right. The voting body can also say, hey, you know what, this process worked out for us. We do the approve of the final candidate. This is fine. Right. Um, but as a constitutional amendment or as a as a part of the Constitution, all this says is once the election is done, if there is a vacant seat or during the term, if somebody resigns and there needs to fill in the vacancy, eBoard has the power to appoint. It doesn't define the process, that process can be left open, but eBoard has the power to appoint and the voting body has to confirm who that is. 
right? Uh, again, so if you just if you decide that ultimately, you know, the democratic aspect of this is the most important thing, it has to be observed. It is a reasonable position to say I don't support this constitutional amendment. Um, the uh, you know, but but the, it is though like um, the one thing I, I'm trying to tell folks right is um, when you're trying to make a decision, the more people you get involved, the longer it will take, but you're going to arrive at a decision that folks feel comfortable with. The less people that get involved in a decision, you're going to be able to make the decision quickly, but it may not necessarily be the decision that all the stakeholders agree with, right? So it's a balancing point that you've got to, um, that that ultimately you all got to decide in terms of whether or not you're going to take uh, accept this constitutional amendment or not. Was that Vivian, were you able to clarify the decision for you? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I understand like where the change came from. Um, I don't know. I think I, I think just for me, I still feel like I would personally rather have a third party maybe be like reviewing applications and selecting candidates versus having you guys picking like the vacant positions for your own board, I think is still like my stance. I see David Actually, raising, David. Oh, oh, sorry, go sorry. ahead. Sorry, no, it's okay. Sure, you wanna finish? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm just gonna add like, especially in the case where it's like more than half the e-board is vacant and, vac and like e-board positions are two years and they have a hand in everything within UNAF. So I feel like it should be like less like of a conflict of interest and maybe like a third party should be involved in that process. David, it's, is, are we on the same topic or did you- Yeah, to same topic. Um, yeah, you're good. I just wanted to echo in real quickly. So. First of all, thank you all for presenting this. this is really well presented. I really did enjoy this. Um, I did, I guess, to um, point out what Vivian said, but also kind of ask y'all a question about is um, I kind of see both sides in which e, there is a reason why we have the appointment system. If you look at the normal US elections, there's a reason why the presidential administration is appointed and not elected for every single person. So um, there is a reason for everything. And so with the conflict of interest, I actually would defend e board and say that there would not be a conflict of interest because in the position that they are in today, they most likely have to uphold a bunch of regulations and protocols that will prevent them from having conflict of interest. So I don't have any doubts in that. I guess I would ask though is um, when you are appointing, and this is for e board to kind of like ask, like, what can you lie out the details of like? Um, how you would go about like finding your appointment. Like you said, you mentioned a little bit about like the qualifications of the candidacy, but I guess like what is, do you have like an underlying like step-by-step -step process that kind of um, describes to us like how your appointment system would work should the special elections not work in your favor in that respect? In a sense, and how I think Kelly, feel free to chime in whenever you feel like it. Um, I, the way we've, talked about it so far is it's truly would be what special elections would have been. It's going to be an application process and then we review where they have to submit in all of how they check off on all the qualifications, their resume, all of that stuff, um, as well as submitting their platform to core. It's just that it's not elaborate. It's essentially elections process, but only to but sped up. So instead of um, it's still an application process, people still apply and then people still submit in there. Um, candidates still submit in uh, present their platform all virtually not a whole Q&A questions. I, we could include that as well. Um, and then that gets presented to the voting body, which is all of y'all um, core and uh, as stated for BOD and cabinet staff. And then there would be a deliberation week where they would each uh, entity would meet and then decide on yes, no, abstain um, and that's that would be the appointment system it's still similar to elections it just doesn't have to one it limits us if we had to do um special elections again now then we would have to reach out to all of the unasa 17 attendees 
again to do special elections because we're still operating on the 2020 um, constitutional uh, constitution. And so we would have to reach out to all those constituents again, uh, reach out to everyone, reach out to the course and to re conduct all that procedure again. And so the the appointment system now would just be a shortened application window. We would personally reach out to people who are interested to apply, uh, if at all, if we're able to fill up all of the e positions, uh, have them submit their platform, present it to the voting body. Voting party will probably take two weeks uh, to be able to review all of the qualifications and then submit a vote. So the process would take about one month. Um, and just to reiterate, like, if you think, like, it's, uh, it depends on, like, the number of applicants, too. If there's, like, two eligible candidates for this one position, we would obviously uh, just share both candidates as well. Um, but just at the moment, as you can see, it's only Am and I, myself, uh, running eBoard right now. And it's really hard to get um, started on a lot of our operations. So having um, a long period of time, six months, to get things running, we're just going to be backed up even more. Um, so just, like, um, if you're thinking like, oh, it's just like one person, um, or they will appoint only one person, um, it depends on the number of applicants. If there's a lot of people who want to apply for EVP or secretary, we'll share all their platforms. But um, as of right now, we don't have applicants. <laughs> um, so that's just me being very transparent about the leadership job right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the transparency. I appreciate it. Um, I know this is a very new change. So um, whatever you do, like just I would ask for like the transparency part, like just kind of underlying what your step by step process is. Um, and myself as a core um, and speaking just for myself, like it'd be nice to kind of see what that process is. So that way we can there's no stone unturned. But um, yeah, again, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, to answer Vivian's question in the chat, yes, so be application but shorter two weeks at max uh one week to collect everyone's platforms and then two weeks afterwards um to present it to voting body and then y'all would get to decide to uh, vote all right you're welcome any other questions from our audience today I'm gonna give it 10 seconds instead of five this time. While we wait uh, to y'all think of questions or look through the document. Uh, if you have any questions after this session ends, uh, please feel free to one, either email us at eboard at unasa.org or our personal emails or the Google form that was sent to you for this session, we will be sharing that out and we will cover that Google form later. Um, just submit a question there and we'll keep up you will keep an eye on it daily to answer any, any and all of your questions from there as well. Hey, Em. What's up? So uh, so just real quick. Uh, so uh, I've checked, I've controlled with Lucy and sorry about that if I missed something during the presentation because we were just going back to make sure that we were on under, we were just trying to make sure we, our position was unanimous here. Um, so in regards to what, who comprises the voting body, uh -huh. um, so Lucy and I uh, uh, and Dan has not yet responded, but uh, you know we just want to be clear that we don't believe the board of directors should be part of the voting body as it relates to um, elections. Uh, we don't believe the board of directors should actually have a say in who the officers are going to be. Would you like me to put a statement in there that says the board of directors will not vote for the elections? Um, I, I mean, you actually, I would actually even suggest that um, we remove uh, the board of directors from the voting body itself. Oh. Um, yeah, I would just to, just to simplify that. I think the only role the board BOD is because the my understanding of the voting, the, uh, the um, language about the voting body is that the voting body only votes collectively when it comes to elections or constitutional amendments. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe BOD should have uh, some participation in any kind of constitutional amendments in part because our object our responsibility is compliance right legal compliance and and perspective but at the end of the day the decisions that get made should be made by you all not by us um, oh okay the yeah the only caveat would be any decisions that you all try to make that uh would be considered illegal or not in compliance would be the things where we jump in sounds good so uh, you want me to remove bod from voting body yes essentially please. all right Changes in action, y'all. Yeah, let's see it firsthand. I'll update the documents <laughs> after this call. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm gonna give five more seconds. 
five seconds silence means no, let's move on. Um, so that's all the questions we have currently from the live audience. We only had one question submitted on the Google form for people who could not make it here today. Um, can y'all see this uh, section here? Uh, so the question was, is there a section in the constitution that to address community safety in the sense of someone who is part of the space has been notified regarding harassment or assault, depending on the situation or how to handle the situation? I believe Kelly. Yeah, I, I can answer this one. Um, so like Lee mentioned earlier um, in today's town hall, we have separate, doc separate documents for like policies, handbooks, et cetera. Um, so it's more of taking, taking um, on operations instead of constitutional changes. Um, it's just easier to implement those. Um, we at the moment um, have a community safety handbook um, that was established during the last term. It serves as the, an overview of the UNASA community safety um, com, uh, committee and they implemented a community uh, safety plan as well. Um, it was implemented during a 2020 to 2022 term that has now been passed forward for our term as well. Um, in terms of uh, any harm or any issues, we do have a UNASA harm reporting process um, that's also detailed in the handbook as well. All right. And so All right. Um, and also, I just want to clarify here. In this, this is a this is this is a great example of why something should not be in the constitution, right? The community safety policy and protocol was created last year, um, and because it's so new, we may want to revisit it often to make sure that the policy is more developed. If you find something that hey, we should tweak this or change that to make it better, more responsive, more effective, we cannot do that if the program is defined in the constitution, because again, the constitution is intended to be very hard to change and it should be rarely or seldom changed, right? So policy, for programs and policies and things that operate, that affect how you do things on a normal daily basis should not be in the constitution. Um, you, we, can state, we can put in statements of values and say, this is important for you NASA to address, right? So it reminds us these are the things that we work on, but um, as a policy, those kind of things should not be in the constitution because if you find anything wrong or ways to improve it, you won't be able to unless you follow the very clear um, amendment procedures that are laid out in the constitution. All right. Um, I think that's it for tonight. Um, so far, closing statements. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I hope tonight's session clarified um, all of the rationales and decisions and why we made these changes. Uh, please review these documents, um, view all the changes. Um, and as a reminder, the recording of this session tonight will be sent to all of your emails. So that's all of your eboard, regional eboard emails, as well as all of the cores you know, emails. Uh, the Google form, the one here, the, the one that's generated from this form will be sent to you all as well with an answer if any new questions are sent in um, to us. And then the uh, Deadline for you to submit your vote um, on the a, on a separate Google form is going to be two weeks from now. It's been extended one additional week for you for y'all to have the time to be able to review and discuss within your own regions. So the deadline is going to be Sunday, October sixteenth at eleven fifty nine p.m. At PT. And yeah, get those votes in. Um, if you don't vote by then, it'll be considered abstain. Uh, but that's been clarified before. But yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for everyone being here tonight. And I hope you all have a great rest of your night. And then at any some point, Kelly's gonna stop the recording. Yeah.